Reconciliation Commission in Canada has concluded the, that country's decades-long policy of forcibly removing indigenous children from their families and placing them in state-funded residential Christian schools amounted to, quote, cultural genocide. After a six-year investigation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report concluded, quote, the Canadian government pursued this policy of cultural genocide because it wished to divest itself of its legal and financial obligations to Aboriginal pe uh, people and gain control over their lands and resources. If every Aboriginal person had been absorbed into the body politic, there would be no reserves, no treaties, and no Aboriginal rights. The first schools opened in 1883. The last one closed in 1998. During that time, over 150,000 Indigenous children were sent away to rid them of their native cultures and languages and integrate them into mainstream Canadian society. Many students recall being beaten for speaking their native languages and losing touch with their parents and customs. The report also documents widespread physical, cultural and sexual abuse at the schools. It was based in part on testimony from 7,000 survivors. This is Justice Murray Sinclair, chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The residential school experience is clearly one of the darkest, most troubling chapters in our collective history. In the period from Confederation until the decision to close residential schools was taken in this country in 1969, Canada clearly participated in a period of cultural genocide. We heard of the effects of over 100 years of mistreatment of more than 150,000 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children placed in these schools. Removed from their families and home communities, seven generations of Aboriginal children were denied their identity. We heard how, separated from their language, their culture, their spiritual traditions, and their collective history, children became unable to answer questions as simple as, where do I come from, where am I going, why am I here, and who am I? Justice Murray Sinclair, chair of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, also said he suspects as many as 7,500 Indigenous children died at the residential schools, but the exact figure may never be known. The Canadian government stopped recording the deaths in 1920 after the chief medical officer at Indian Affairs suggested children in the schools were dying at an alarming rate. To talk more about the Truth and Reconciliation so in that clip, we got a glimpse at um, what some of the children experienced in terms of the uh, sexual, physical, emotional, psychological abuse uh, that went on in the residential schools. Um, this is an overview of some of the uh, ways of assimilation uh, that the children would have experienced. Uh, so children were taught that their culture, their spiritual beliefs, their languages, and even their clothing were inferior and wrong. Um, so there was this perception that traditions of uh, First Nations were uncivilized, inferior, less than, uh, inhumane, or inhuman, subhuman, uh, primitive, and wrong. Uh, and they were, the schools were sort of uh, trying to teach the, the children a new way of being. Um, and they were not allowed to speak their languages. They uh, were often severely punished if they were caught doing, um, caught uh, speaking their own languages. Um, and there was other ways that uh, their physicality was altered. Um, their hair was cut and their clothes were, you know, changed to match the kind of Euro-Canadian look at that time in history. And even some children uh, were given a new name uh, as a way to assimilate them. Uh, and we see uh, residential school experiences vary per student. Um, some students re reflect uh, fondly uh, on the residential schools. Um, some people talk about, you know, that they learned some valuable skills. 
um, that helped benefit them um, in later in life, but uh, there is very much, uh, you know, a lot of damage that occurred in terms of um, abuse that occurred in those schools. And we can see that there is a legacy, a long lasting legacy that has uh, extended over seven generations of uh, those children who were uh, placed in the schools. So we see a loss of language and identity. We see harsh punishments and abuse. Uh, we see sickness and death, hunger and poor nutrition, uh, poor education and often menial labor, uh, even blocked or arranged marriages were part of the residential school system. And we can see some of the impacts uh, lasting, you know, some students were there for, you know, the, uh, a, you know, a period of their lives, but the long lasting effects um, of that traumatic, the tra traumatic events they experienced in their childhood uh, carried over into their adult lives and when they became parents their their children are, were also affected by the legacy of residential schools even if they themselves uh, never experienced that. Um, so when children were taken from their homes, their families, uh, often the community itself was traumatized, um, not just the children but the communities were also uh, left in despair. Many people either as a way to cope with the trauma uh, afterwards or uh, in despair of their having their children taken from them. Uh, there was, you know, a, alcohol was used as a way of coping um, or forgetting. And children were often deprived of normal family life and did not learn uh, how to be parents. So when it became time for them in their uh, maturity to have children, um, they didn't have the parenting skills that they would have gained from their own parents. Um, and many, and we'll see this with uh, um, the Arlene Morasti, who is Augie Morasti's daughter, talks about actually experiencing some um, very harsh punishments from her father and she understood where those came from once she learned of his uh, residential school experiences. So there's patterns of behavior that are cycles of, you know, violence that are carried over um, from the children who were in residential schools and then in their families later on in life. Um, we can also talk about the, the stripping of identity uh, and how that affects somebody long after the event is over. Um, so even though many people maybe physically survive the event in a spiritual or psychological way, uh, those people may be still haunted by their memories of what happened to them. Um, so some, I mean, there's a large number of, of students who didn't make it out alive, um, either from disease or, or abuse, uh, suicide. Um, and, uh, you know, these stories are becoming more prevalent uh, since the 1990s when uh, people, residential school survivors, uh, were starting to share their uh, experiences with the rest of Canadian society. And um, there's those stories went from being silent and, and repressed and excluded from uh, our culture into being, um, you know, shared and acknowledged and we have something important like the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission that, you know, interviewed 7,000 uh, residential school survivors to get and understand and, and make known uh, what happened uh, to those people and to generations of people. Um, and also, you know, to to acknowledge that, you know, many people didn't survive that experience and, and what they went through. So it's so important to sort of speak out about um, those stories uh, that have been silenced in our society for so long. So we've also seen uh, a lot of changes uh, since many of the survivors have come forward uh, to talk about their experiences. Uh, we've had the government issuing an apology 
um, Stephen Harper in 2008 uh, issued an apology saying, you know, we are sorry for uh, the government's role in um, targeting children and isolating them from their homes and families and culture. Um, and he called uh, this residential schools a sad chapter in Canadian history and acknowledged that the system was very harmful and wrong. Uh, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was uh, established in 2008 and this was um, a way for uh, these stories, the history of uh, residential schools and the impact that it's had um, to be recognized and acknowledged in Canadian society. And it's also been a, a way of uh, moving towards reconciliation between uh, Aboriginal families and communities uh, with non-Aboriginal Canadians and, and government and churches and so on. Um, so it's a sort of collective uh, historical record of the residential schools and it tries to sort of document as completely as possible uh, what those experiences were and uh, the lasting impacts of them and it's been a way to sort of really promote uh, and educate the wider Canadian society about uh, residential schools. Um, there's been church apologies as well and um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Augie Morasti and, and in his in his memoir he talks a lot about you know recording his stories as part of a class action suit and that was also um, established in 2007 where uh, there was actually um, a settlement agreement uh, to uh, compensate uh, students, former residential school students, um, uh, financially for uh, their what what the government um, inflicted upon them as as children. Uh, so Augie will record his narrative. Um, submit his stories to the lawyer and that was part of his process of recording his, his testimony and documents for this uh, settlement agreement. Um, but he decided to also uh, record his stories as a memoir uh, and that's what we get with the education of Augie Morasti.